My warmest thanks to Elizabeth Cropper, to the APS administration as a whole, and to all of you for this chance to represent my branch of learning by focusing on such cardinal constituents of the human condition as tale and interpretation. Among terms that designate our species, homo interpretans stands out. At work and play, we constantly recount and interpret. Understanding these activities holds increasing urgency with the rapid and radical transformation of outlooks on story and history, fact and fiction, text and image, truth and lie. Traditionally, the humanities impart materials and methods for reaching and refining insights about such matters. Equally, they generate pleasure and facilitate progress from knowledge to wisdom. As a group, humanists have preferred particulars over percentages. On that principle, I'll fashion or attempt to fashion a pattern from specifics. Fifteen years ago, I became enthralled by an anonymous poem from the 1230s. In a French dialect, it tells of a professional acrobat or dancer who wearies of wayfaring, gives up worldly possessions, and enters a monastery. Once having joined, he despairs. His peers comprehend Latin, can worship properly, and have other skills that he lacks. The erstwhile entertainer judges himself a failure, not certain even when to stay silent or to speak. His solution, in the crypt, he happens upon a statue of the Virgin Mary. Whenever the brethren enact the liturgy in the choir above, he dances as he once did outside. The other brothers remark upon his absence, and two of them tail him. After spying him stripped down to his underwear and execute his floor exercise before the Madonna, they run off and denounce him. Their abbot accompanies, him, accompanies them below, where he too is shocked by the blasphemy until a miracle takes place. <laughs> Notre Dame, through the sculpture depicting her, soothes the tumbler by wiping away his sweat and fanning him. This piece of poetry survives in five manuscripts. A miniature illustrating it appears in one. The painter alters the climax freely. He adds an angel who extends a cloth downward from a heavenly cloud. He portrays the gymnast as fully clothed, and he supplies at the foot of the altar a fiddle. Besides the French, a brief Latin exemplum, it too of unknown authorship, is extant from the 1270s. Like the illumination, this later thumbnail has distinct features. Whereas the vernacular emphasizes repentance, the version in the learned tongue is subsumed under the heading of joy. More revolutionarily, it it substitutes for the Madonna, God. In studying this story, I rebelled against stale dictates about a book's ideal length. Sinatra has never been my role model, but his I did it my way resonated. First, I explored not only the 13th century poem, but also its reinventions after being unearthed in the late 19th century. Then I lodged the reception within the framework of medieval revivalism more broadly. Finally, I put analysis of the literature and its context in dialogue with images. The result comprises six volumes, close to 2,500 pages and 1,200 figures. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, my research demanded publications tied too closely to popular culture for research libraries to have collected them, but too antiquated and exotic for public ones to have bought them in the first place or to have retained them afterward. Surveying my de facto archive, I resolved to mount a temporary museum exhibition. Realizing that Dumbarton Oaks possessed unique assets for such an installation, I set out to achieve the most modest of objectives, to connect past and present, Europe and United States, humanities and arts, high and low culture, Middle Ages and medievalism. The show afforded uh, me a novel opportunity to tell tales and to attain grander audiences, and then toward that end, as, as you've heard, I coordinated translations and reprints along with story readings, conversations with authors, musical performances, and more. But let's begin with revivalism, what could be identified as the medievalizing of the US. <laughs> the iconic American Gothic by Grant Wood from 1930 makes a perfect start with its primly banal couple whose clothing echoes the painted window, pointed window above, preposterously out of place against the plain and unpretentious frame house. Why did this architecture penetrate to the prairie? For one thing, it offered a means of controlling the unfamiliar and threatening. Think of the disruption that a person born in 1840 would experience before dying in, say, 1920. In technology, in science, in transportation, and all of these leaps coincided with I said technology. <laughs> With the rise of corporations, concentration of wealth, mechanization of agriculture, surge of immigration, and rush of urbanization, the changes ushered in new ideologies and political movements. Against a backdrop that makes the past 75 years almost tranquil, people worldwide resorted to the Middle Ages for its imagined serenity. In English, Sir Walter Scott and Tennyson reigned supreme. In French, Victor Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris. In the US, the same nostalgia for the innocent faith of olden times shows in consumer items. Mass-produced uh, uh, products were bottled in cathedral glass. Cathedral style, it's fighting. <laughs> Cathedral style cases for bracket clocks were then appropriated for radios, the home entertainment centers of the 1930s. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the United States flexed its newfound wealth and might. With all the reserves at its disposal, it sought out and it modified its cultural precedents. Its decisions can be readily detected in the nation's capital. At first glance, Washington resembles a Greco-Roman theme park. <laughs> Take the Capitol building, shown already by David Rosen substantially finished by 1863. Then, the Lincoln Memorial, dedicated in 1922, and finally, the Jefferson Memorial, put into service in 1943. These choices make sense in, as America modeled its government and judiciary on Athens and Rome, it adopted architectures associated with them. But the DC theme park also exudes medieval character. The 19th century witnessed successive architectural revivals as the country went through dress-up phases. It's, it's fine. <laughs> 
There it is. The Scottish-born congressman who propelled the Smithsonian Foundation and oversaw the selection of its architect favored the Middle Ages. The frontispiece of the prospectus made clear his view of Gothic as inherently natural and by implication, here's a surprise, intrinsically suited to a new world with immense geological formations and forest. The naturalist John Muir, also Scottish-American, often described the continent's natural resources as cathedrals. Beyond the Gothic of nature, the U.S. commanded two others. One was salvaged from Europe, the most considerable being the cloisters, medieval branch of the Metropolitan Museum. This photo captures its first manifestation in Manhattan, still in the hands of a private entrepreneur, before being uprooted again to its present location. The other Gothic America was built from scratch, which leads back to the Smithsonian. James Renwick Jr. submitted two medievalesque designs. One was picked for the 1855 museum, and the other served for Trinity Episcopal. Although the church fell to the wrecking ball in 1936, DC is still bracketed by medieval houses of prayer, two of the three, three highest inhabitable buildings. To the west, the National Cathedral stands above Georgetown. Northeast, you'll find the National Shrine. For most of its life, the third of the tall triad has been referred to as the old post office building. Although towering only by DC's low rise standards, it belongs loosely to the category of skyscraper Gothic. Such structures are sprinkled across the country. The manor held outsized significance as builders pivoted from the horizontal layout of classical basilicas and temples to the vertical thrust of burgeoning cities. This postcard of Brooklyn Bridge with the Woolworth Building brings home the suitability of Gothic to early 20th century US modernism. Before leaving Washington, peek at what looms over those approaching Georgetown from the Virginia Riverbank. This hulk is the central monument of Georgetown University, the consummately Victorian Gothic Healy Hall, which equates to, say, College Hall here in Philly. Gothic was a recommended idiom for religion, museums, education, and tall edifices. Such constructions are easily dis dismissed as faux, but bear in mind that tourists often mistake the modern for medieval across the Atlantic too. The gargoyles of poor Notre Dame de Paris date not from the Middle Ages, but from Violet le Duc's mid 19th century renovation. Across the channel, we find such fixtures as the Palace of Westminster, the foundation stone for which was not laid until 1840, and Tower Bridge, not finalized until 1894. Now let's take back to the story. It endured through the late Middle Ages, but then went dormant. Reformers, Reformers would not have abided a narrative about monks and Marianism. Iconoclasm was the order of the day. Meanwhile, counter-reformers could not accept a layman holier than clergy who sidestepped the hierarchy and made a beeline to the Virgin, not using Latin, and in fact, not em even employing language at all. 
And so the tale trail runs cold. The story of the story resumes after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. A romance philologist in present-day Austria chanced upon a codex. By good luck, it turned out to be the best of the five. He submitted his edition to a brand new journal co-founded by France's premier romance philologist. This Gaston Paris talked up the tale wherever he could. Through Paris, the Trouvé drew the notice of the elite. Anatole France's succinct short story converted the jongleur into his cousin, the juggler, and attached to the narrative by its name, uh, its, its new name, Le Jongleur de Notre Dame. His retelling enjoyed an enormous vogue, especially in France and the Anglo-American world. It accorded well with Gothic revivalism. After the humiliating defeat by the Germans, France had to remake itself. It underwent wrenching social debates in the Belle Epoque. The medieval period furnished a safe space. The Middle Ages contributed loser heroes, the male lead from the Song of Roland and the female Saint Joan of Arc. The juggler became a minor divinity in this pantheon. To confirm the last point, we need look no further than one publishing house. In 1906, the artist Malatesta calligraphed and illustrated profusely for Ferrou a pseudo-medieval manuscript r retailed to connoisseurs. And then not two decades later, same story, Maurice Lolo redid the mini masterpiece for the same firm in 1924, but in Art Deco. Anatole France's few pages might have halted the ascent of the juggler of Our Lady. Few other authors would have dared to redo the little gem after he won the Nobel Prize in 1921. They might have been further discouraged after his oeuvre earned extra notoriety from being inscribed on the index of forbidden books in 1922. But creative agents in other media didn't labor under this anxiety of influence. Jules Massenet, the most commercially successful French composer of his day, concocted an opera on the subject in 1902. His smash hit soon had runs not only throughout Europe, but likewise in North Africa and both Americas. In the US, it soared courtesy of Oscar Hammerstein I and the soprano around whom the impresario formed a company to compete with the Metropolitan. The diva was Mary Garden, born in Scotland, bred in the United States, and trained in France. After she took Par pa Paris by storm, Hammerstein prevailed upon her to try her fortune in the Big Apple. Though forgotten today, in comparison with other celebrities, such as the actor Sarah Bernhardt or dancer Isadora Duncan, she did more than anyone for the story's subsequent American success. The musical drama impressed spectators hugely. It passed into radio and audio recordings, into dance, and into movies. In the early 1950s, Fred Waring included it annually as Christmas fair in his variety show. In 1960, Tony Curtis produced his own take on it for television. Of the films, the best is a short released in 58 with voiceover by Boris Karloff, which animates a book by Ar the graphic artist R.O. Blackman. Two big questions have dogged the story since the 20th century. Is it religious or not? For young readers or not? The tale has frequently become quarantined in children's literature. An American woman initiated the practice in 1917 with The Little Juggler. Over the past century, the fiction has sometimes been reduced to triviality. Ponder this pop-up from 1991. More often, it's elicited loving creativity. 1991 also saw this version by a Swiss-German 
and Czech Italian illustrator. To return to the US, Barbara Cooney, two-time Caldecott medalist, brought out her iteration in 1961. Tommy De Paula, rock star among the knee-high set, wanted the juggler of his inaugural as his inaugural volume, but because of her crowding of the market, had to wait until 78. The Shannon brothers did their version in 1999. The Swede, Helena Olafsson, in 2000. Not for youths, but for the young at heart, is a miniature crafted in 2003. Its creator conceived of the format, do, do as an homage to the marriage of her son. And her son was Timothy Hutton, uh, and he married a French children's book artist, Aurore, brace yourself, Giscard d'Estaing. <laughs> the story's high culture apogee uh, was a ballad by W.H. Auden, illustrated by Edward Gorey for the New York Review of Books, Christmas 1969. Four years later, the broadside was reissued for the Poets Memorial Service in St. John the Divine. In representational art, the motif was parodied by a Franco-American sculptor, Armand. The statue was cast in 1994. It belongs to a genre he called trans sculpture. The most recent form is a magnificent panel of stained glass completed in June 2018. Now, Cooney confessed that she decided to name her next child, if it were a boy, after the little juggler. And so she did, as I discovered from Googling. Her son was very nice about what could have seemed a creepy inquiry. His main response was a heartfelt interrogative. But what does the story mean? Why did my mother name me after the, the little juggler? Even after years of investigation, I can't answer at all for sure. I do know that despite its simplicity, it probes deep matters such as anxiety of gift giving, insecurity of would-be artist, nature of prayer, and danger of hasty judgment. One additional factor risks sounding corny, but here goes. The atmosphere nowadays in the United States is frequently labeled toxic, and who would argue? In such an environment, this kind of tale can serve as an antidote. The intellectual and cultural engagement of learning from the past and participating in compare and contrast interpretation is inherently good. To revert to my opening suggestion, human beings are, by instinct, tellers and storytellers. In that spirit, what do you make of the juggler? Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, where's Annie? I'm looking. Yes, we're okay, are we? Um, some questions. We have one at the front. This is a question out of complete ignorance. I, I, I now know a million times more than I knew half an hour ago about this topic. Are there similar themes in the non-Western literature, either from Asia or from Africa? Um, there, there are stories in many different cultures about people who engage in uh, sacred dance by themselves and have conflicts with the religious hier hierarchy. And, and so there, there are figures like that elsewhere. They're, they're not exactly like this story, but uh, there are episodes in reality that occur around the world. And then there are, um, it, there are narratives that are, that, that are fictions uh, about the same sorts of motifs. I, and there's something um, 
that, that has drawn people innately to these. There, there are dancing saints in the Philippines and uh, rituals there. And then there also are uh, stories very similar in uh, Hasidic literature from Eastern Europe from the 18th century on. Thank you. <laughs> Charlotte Greenspan from Ithaca, New York. Um, I'm wondering how it turned from an adult jongleur, or at what, what point, to a child, and what that says about, I don't know, Christmas being for children, Amal and the Night Visitors, the little drummer boy, right. Innocence. Um, is there a time when Innocence can only belong to a young man? or a young person? In some, I, 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 you, you've touched on uh, several uh, r really important points and, and a, a little bit um, depressing in some ways that already by the late 19th century, people felt that um, society had begun to get old and they looked back to the Middle Ages as being a time of childlike innocence and faith. And uh, so, so, so it was a place of nostalgia for them for something that they felt that the human condition risks somehow losing because of the complexity of the world, which I think in some ways, uh, I mean, obviously there are a lot of parallels between that period and uh, now. As for when the protagonist became a child, that happened, that started in that story from 1917 by the American children's book author. And I think that there's a regular, it's not easy to formulate a rule about it, but when stories become extremely well known, they often um, end up being parodied in one fork and then passing into children's literature in the other fork. And I think that that process has been hastened with this story because uh, I think that it became, it, it had been a mainstay in French language education because it was uh, short and good for teaching. And then it was also extremely popular in anthologies. Again, the short story as a genre had an importance from Maupassant and Anatole France that uh, just has been largely lost in, in our culture, except in places like, say, the, you know, people pay attention to the New Yorker, but the short story is not as commercially um, viable as it used to be. So I think that um, it, it was probably bound to dip a little bit, but that was hastened by the fact that people are so afraid of teaching stories that have religion in them. And, we're, and I think that we risk being in a situation where we're equally ignorant about all religions apart from our own faith, which would include secular humanism, uh, when, when a, a preferable situation might be to learn a little bit about other religions at an early age, but not in a proselytic way. Thank you. I think one more question is permitted. I'm still thinking about the contrast between the neoclassical and the neo-Gothic in Washington, D.C., and the Smithsonian and all that wonderful material you gave us. And I'm wondering if one, um, we could think of the capital as imperial <laughs> and uh, Gothic as romantic. And there's, um, and you know, the humanists, the rulers, one male, one female. I mean, there's a real contrast, and they play against each other all through the 19th century with the Gothic and the neoclass, uh, neoclassical intercepting. And I just wondered what you thought about that. 
Oh, thank, thank you. No, I've, I've, uh, I, I've mulled about this so uh, a, a, a lot. I make no claims to be, I, I've got a colleague from History of Art and Architecture sitting up here. I'm not going to claim to be an art or architectural historian, but uh, it, it, it seems to me, I referred to a, a, a national phase of dress up uh, and that the, the medieval came to be used for churches, for education, and for cultural institutions. Uh, we forget about, we, it's so much around us that we forget. I think that an early 19th century person transported to the late 19th century would have been flabbergasted to see the Protestant churches using the cruciform shape using pointed arches, having stained glass, things that just would have uh, been scandalous at the beginning of the century. But I think that, that uh, people coming from the beginning of the century also would have been startled to encounter uh, not museums developed in a classical model along the lines of Athenea, which is what they would have known, but to, but to find things like the original Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which was dedicated on, opened on July 4th, 1876, not an accidental date, and, and that was built in a, a Ruskinian uh, Gothic style. So I, I think that there was this wide array of purposes that, that actually is still of great import to societies such as this, because I would argue that, the, that our conception of the um, Ivory Tower owes to the large Gothic Revival towers that were a fixture of Bryn Mawr, uh, Princeton, Yale, uh, Chicago, Toronto. You know, you, it's just a, 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 a huge uh, list. And, and that the Middle Ages still are something that, that uh, is with us in that way. And, and I, I've been deeply, I have felt very cornered intellectually lately because uh, there's such fear of alt-right appropriation in some quarters that people are almost ashamed of connecting with, with the Middle Ages. I, I feel as if uh, bad use has been made of the period before. It certainly was during the Nazi period, but that that doesn't, uh, taint the, the, the period uh, ir irreparably. There have been many good people who've worked with, with it, and in, at, at any rate, it's important to know the past to know yourself. It's important to know the past to know the present and to be able to make good judgments about the, the future. I was just uh, dismayed back, this will be my last uh, comment, I promise, but I, I was just d dismayed when uh, they were talking about changing the history exam so that it would begin in 1450 uh, rather than covering er er earlier periods. Um, it, it seemed so painful to me because if there's one historical paradigm that people, no matter how ignorant, in this country are aware of without knowing the name, it's decline and fall. And, and he, here you are setting up a, a structure for teaching history that would allow them exposure to that only by the fact that Constantinople fell to the Ottomans in 1453. I mean, so I, I, I will stop there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.